Hello, Jeff Zwerink. Welcome to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas and how they relate to the truth of Christianity. I'm joined today by Dr. Hugh Ross, founder and president of Reasons to Believe, and we're going to explore fine-tuning and respond to one common objection to fine-tuning. Hugh, it's good to have you here today. Looking forward to our time to talk. Yeah, good to be with you, Jeff. So fine-tuning is something that people talk a lot about. Uh, I would take a few, take a minute here and just kind of briefly describe fine tuning and what are the sorts of evidence we see for it? Yeah, usually it goes by the name anthropic principle. And this is the idea that the existence of humanity in the universe requires severe constraints on the characteristics of the universe and the laws of physics. So give us an example. What are some of the examples where we see this fine tuning play out? While the universe has to be a particular mass, make the mass any greater, any smaller, you get the wrong elements. You won't get the elements you need for life. Uh, or you come a little closer to home. Uh, you know, we have to be orbiting a very highly fine-tuned star in order for advanced life to exist here on Earth. The Earth has got to be a particular distance. The Earth has to have a particular density. There's literally over a thousand different characteristics of the Earth, our galaxy, uh, the planets in our planetary system, the universe, the laws of physics that must be fine-tuned in order for us to exist here in the universe. So, so the fine-tuning really boils down to if the universe were slightly different in any number of ways, and I know people quibble about how many there are and, and stuff like that, but it does seem like if the universe were slightly different or our location in the universe or position were slightly different, that would make it problematic for life. So yeah. in that context, what is this puddle analogy um, and that, it, that is used to argue against this being fine-tuning? Yeah, a number of uh, non-theists have made the point, hey, this fine-tuning argument you uh, theists use uh, really is flawed. I mean, look at a puddle. Uh, you know, the water in a puddle says, hey, uh, this uh, hole that I'm in uh, perfectly fits me. And therefore assumes that the hole was designed uh, for the existence uh, of the puddle. And so the obvious implication, you know, the whole the puddle just fills up whatever the hole is. And so there's really no that that, that would seem to remove the fine tuning. Well, so the argument is that, you know, whatever life there is, it's going to adapt to whatever universe that it is in, just like water is going to adapt to whatever hole it finds itself in. That's the argument. So does this puddle analogy refute the notion of fine tuning? I don't think it does, because uh, there's a fundamental, uh, several fundamental flaws in this analogy. Life is not like uh, liquid water. Liquid water will flow and fill whatever hole it's in. But that's not true of life. Life needs a very particular environment in which it exists. You just can't take the life on planet Earth and throw it anywhere else in the universe and expect it to survive. Uh, or change the laws of physics in the universe and expect it to, to survive. So it's not like any old universe will do, or any old star will do, or any old planet will do. Uh, that's why I don't think this is an analogy. Analogies to work have to be somewhat similar to the two things you're comparing. In this case, there really is no comparison. So, uh, you know, I, I agree, and I get your point there. I know some would, I would look at that and respond and say, you know, well, when we look at life here on Earth, life seems to basically fill whatever niche there is here on earth. I mean, you can make a strong argument that anywhere life can exist on earth, it does. And in fact, it exists in places we didn't think it could exist. So um, how would you respond to that? Because that does seem to give credence to the puddle analogy that where we have life here on earth, it seems to have adapted to whatever environment. Well, I mean, we've now found nearly 5,000 planets outside of our solar system. And all of them have the characteristics that wouldn't permit our existence. So it's like, hey, yeah, we got a special example here on Earth. But that is the fine-tuning argument that Earth, the solar system, our galaxy, or galaxy cluster, the universe has been fine-tuned to make possible our existence. And I think the evidence for that is when we look at other stars, we look at other galaxies, we look at, look at other planets and moons, we see that they're hostile for life. I mean, even my friends who are not theistic in their astronomy and physics agree with me. They agree with you, Jeff. Everywhere we look in the universe, we see conditions that are hostile for our existence, except here on Earth. It doesn't mean that we could possibly find one, but so far we haven't. 
and we've been doing a lot of looking. So, I mean, I, I agree you know, that if you take Earth life and put it somewhere else, that it's going to have problems living there. But right. isn't there a little, I mean, isn't there a little bit of an Earth centricness to that argument in the sense that I think, uh, you know, a skeptic would say, well, obviously it's not going to be Earth life that arises on these other planets, but there's going to be some other form of life. Uh, that, and again, that, that's kind of the backbone of the puddle analogy is that life is going to find a way to come about and adapt to the environment. How would you respond to that objection? Well, I think that argument would work if there were actually demonstrable alternatives to carbon-based life, but they're not. I mean, you could bring Fuzrana in here and he would share with you that of all the elements we see in the periodic table, carbon is the only element that has a necessary bonding stability and bonding complexity to make physical life possible. So it's got to be life as we know it. In other words, carbon base. And the fact is, to get just one planet on which carbon based life must exist, you need a universe of the size and the mass and the age of our universe. The whole universe, as we observe, must exist to make one sample size possible. And so, in that sense, I don't think uh, we're being narcissistic and saying, hey, uh, there's something special about Earth. The fact that you need the whole universe just to get a single planet, I think helps. And also to recognize that uh, if there's a creator that created this universe with the intent of having a place where there was life, it would make sense that he would make that life on that one planet very abundant and very diverse. It's actually a theme you see in Psalm 104, that no matter where you go on planet Earth, you find the evidence for the creatures that God made. You know, I, I actually think your your statement about you get the whole universe to take just one planet, I actually think that's overly optimistic. I think apart from God's intervention, we're not going to see any place in the universe that's habitable for life. But right. I, you know, let's, I want to take a little bit of a different look on this and just maybe in a minute, can you, if, if your argument, which I agree with, that the puddle analogy is not a good refutation of the, the fine tuning and the design because uh, it's not a good analogy, what sort of evidence would we expect to see in the future or what evidence could we look for that might help validate the idea that this is not a good analogy and not a good refutation of fine tuning? Well, there have been several astronomers and physicists who are not Christians who have made the point that there is validity to this theistic interpretation of the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle will have predictive power. And what I find interesting is just the number of papers I see in the astrophysical peer-reviewed literature that demonstrate that indeed the anthropic principle has predictive power in the sense that if we find fine tuning, say in certain different features of the moon, if we study the moon in more depth, we're going to find more fine tuned features. Same thing with our galaxy, same thing with our star. And that's been the track record of the past 60 years is that, uh, you know, as we find these fine tuning uh, measurements, they lead, they, they give us a pathway to find more. On the other hand, if we were to discover more and more about the universe and see that the fine tuning evidence was plateauing rather than increasing, then I think the non theists might have a point. Well, thanks very much, Hugh. I appreciate your comments. You know, when I, when I look at it, I do find the puddle analogy to be interesting and, and it forces us to dig in and think more carefully about this. But really what I find is that deeper investigation actually shows the robustness of fine tuning. And this idea that there's fine tuning provides a good scientific avenue for further exploring our universe. You know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org and check out Hugh's blog on this. It's called, Does the Puddle Analogy Explain Cosmic Fine Tuning? It gives you some great resources of what the puddle analogy is, what some of the fine tuning is, and how you can use it to share people and point, share with people and point them to the truth of the gospel.